Okay. Good morning. My name is Irene, and along with Rakan Bach, I am a co-coordinator of New Mexico Listens. New Mexico Listens has been operating for about a year under the auspices of the Humanities Council in New Mexico. We are also affiliated with the League of Women Voters in Santa Fe County. And this morning, we have a theme that is definitely league connected. We're talking about voting and being active in the civic light life of our community. We have a superb panel and they'll be introduced in just a few minutes. I'm also very proud to say that this is our third event with the Human Rights Alliance. We're very honored and proud to be part of HRA and helping them with their important mission. And I welcome you to this event. And I'm looking at my coworker here, Rakan. Have I forgotten anything? She's my brain. Anyway, I haven't forgotten everything and welcome to New Mexico Listens. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Bowen. I uh, am the president of the Human Rights Alliance and my pronouns are he, him, his. And I've been known now occasionally to consider they. So that's a, that's a step forward in uh, a new day for someone of my age group. Uh, why are we doing this is the, um, probably the question. And the, and the answer is because we feel it's really important that people stay uh, motivated and involved in their place where they are in their locale. That could be civically, it could be uh, volunteering for organizations. But the most important thing that all of us can do that live in this country is to vote. And that's really the reason why we're doing this is because we're trying to um, motivate people in a different age group, so to speak. Um, because here in New Mexico, you can start voting at 18. And we know statistically nationally that the 18 to 30 age group really doesn't vote very much at all. And even the 30 to 39 age group, the percentages are really kind of shocking. And our organization and a number of other organizations believe if we can increase the voter turnout among the people that need smart policy the most, the youth, then we can really make some strides and things happening instead of letting, no offense to anyone, a bunch of older white people control things. So with that being said, um, I don't think we're going to have any answers at the end of this session. I think we're going to have some great ideas. And the first thing we need to do is I'm going to have each panelist introduce themselves. And we'll start with Nolan. Hi, my name is Nolan Hall. I'm a member of the Navajo Nation and a senior at the Santa Fe Indian School. And I'm also a member of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force for the state of New Mexico. Um, my pronouns are he and him. Zoe. Hi, my name is Zoe Whittle. Um, I grew up in Santa Fe, went to college in Iowa and moved back here. Um, I've been very involved with various queer organizations for years now. I was the head of the BiPan Fluid organization at Grinnell College. I was also one of the match coordinators for the queer mentorship program. And now I work with the Santa Fe Human Rights Alliance sometimes. And my pronouns are they or she. Hi, my name is Mark Westberg. I am a freelance artist, performer, and musician, originally from Seattle, Washington, um, and now currently residing in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and having done so for about a little over a decade. Uh, originally attended Santa Fe University of Art and Design for performance, and when I was in college there, I actually worked with a group called co-pilots, which helped members of the international student body get kind of settled in and welcome to the whole school and the environment and all that. Um, I've done various committee work, having served with this lovely human over here on Santa Fe Human Rights Alliance. I have also done Chart Santa Fe and am now currently working with the board, helping to save the Greer Garson Theater over at the uh, Safwad campus. 
So um, yeah, that's a little bit of what I do. And my pronouns are, I usually prefer they and them, though that kind of depends on what expressions I'm veering towards more so on other days. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me and take it away. Um, my name is Selena Richardson. Pronouns are she and her. I volunteered with Kiwanis organizations for about 15 years, and now I currently have the very wonderful pleasure of being in Common Bond, New Mexico, and helping run one of their projects, the Under 21 Youth Group. Great. So, quite a diverse group of people. Um, and before I forget, we also must um, pay respect um, to the land that we stand on that really didn't belong to us as um, white descendants. And um, that is first and foremost, something that we should always do here and anywhere in this country. Um, but I'm gonna go randomly now with the question is why Zoe, did you, <laughs> scared her now, why did you decide to get involved and do something? And um, also, it's a safe space here. So if you want to share some things, um, that's fine. If you don't feel like sharing too much personal, you don't have to, but you know, why? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really big question. And I think it's, it's easy to just talk in cliches like the personal is political because it is everything is political I think when when you exist as someone who is marginalized in any way by you know the heteropatriarchy or white supremacy or any of it um you are sort of forced to become active politically and you're forced to care about things um if you care about yourself or your own existence or or just basic human rights, you know, I think it's to me, caring about the state of the world is so fundamental that it's hard to even think about when that happened for me. I'm sure it was middle school or high school. Um, you know, I I did grow up with parents who who cared about things to an extent. I was lucky in that regard. Um, and I think going on my own queer journey and my own sort of educational journey, going to college, um, taking more classes in gender studies and sociology and political science and looking at the the way that the world has been set up and everything that is wrong with it and everything that can be right about it um I just think it's very important for all of us to do what we can and that means voting and that also means organizing and it means forming community and it means advocating for the causes that mean something to us and you know, voting voting is one thing among many um, that I think it's really important to do. I think it's important to do all of them. And yeah, like I said, I, I can't really pinpoint just one thing that, that made me care about the world or made me politically active. It's just kind of the, the fact of existing in this country and in this world. Yeah. Good. Selena. Uh, for me, I tend to believe that if you volunteer in anything, if you're helping any community, working for any sort of nonprofit, uh, even though you are considered just a volunteer, you're, you're working in political fields because you're seeing the after effects of politics. You're seeing who's left behind. I come from a town that is considered to be a town that is left behind. It is one that is dying and it's one that people are just kind of putting an expiration date on. It's one that used to be a company town and it's one that has specifically a lot of homophobia. And so I grew up in the type of community that feels the after effects of being left behind by politics and being left behind by legislation. Um, so I found out at a very young age that the only way to not get left behind is to advocate for yourself 
um, because your voice is going to be the loudest one in the room. And so it got me involved with a lot of the stuff I do today and makes me very appreciative of getting to see how many youth are able to get so involved. Great, great. Nolan. So I similarly have had an experience like Zoe um, where just existing as myself, I feel like I saw how that related politically just because I am a native person as well as um, an LGBTQ plus two spirit. Um, that's how I identify. And so I feel like growing up, I saw a lot of, I've dealt with a lot of homophobia or other issues that people have discriminated against me. Um, and I feel like I saw in the news and I saw in politics change happening. And I feel like I also wanted to be a part of that change just because I have a responsibility to my people. Um, I, I've gone, I feel like I got involved at a younger age. Um, throughout my youth, I attended countless MMIW protests and um, just trying to bring awareness to MMIW as well as um, several LGBTQ plus protests and speaking um, publicly like now. Um, I just feel like it was my responsibility to other people like me. Um, I, I feel like one of the major turning points I saw though was I believe I was in third or fourth grade when gay marriage was legalized. And that was one of the big ones where it was like, I always, or not even before I identified it myself, but like, I've always been expressed. I have always been expressive of my LGBTQ identity as a two-spirit person. I've always just kind of been who I wanted to be from a very young age. And to see that the world was changing to an environment where I could be accepted or other people like me could have a more accepting environment was really important. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like it just ultimately ties into, I feel a responsibility for other people like me who may not have a platform or support a family like I do to be able to um, speak publicly or create change. And that's why I wanted to get involved. Impressive, Nolan. Mark, hi. Well, kind of echoing, I guess, what everyone has said here about just existing and that being, you know, kind of a central core reason for getting involved and all that. I grew up um, on as a mentally divergent person. I'm on the autism spectrum and always kind of knowing I was queer well before I ever came out a little bit later in life. But um, I dealt with a lot of bullies, grew up with a lot of them, either be they peers or even just people making decisions. Um, so I kind of understood, I got to kind of learn about the importance of local elections and just getting involved locally, especially for a long time. And it got to the point where I had to ask myself, you know, what am I going to do about these different kinds of bullies? and people who look down on people and make people feel this inferior version of like being different for no reason, you know, because of their standards. So I just had to, you know, I basically had to accept there's no way that I can't, you know, get in, I, mean, I have to get involved, you know, I just have to. Um, and it's, un and I know it's unfair to have to say that as a person who, you know, fits into a marginalized group or more in some way it's unfair to have to say that in 2022 in the 21st century where we should be well past evolved on many things but what's happened has happened and uh, what's happening now is happening now and you know we've just got to take this seriously and come together as a big family basically and look out for one another and um and we need out good ally and healthy allyship as well so um yeah that's my piece on that <laughs> great mark thank you so the problem that i have as someone who's older um and you might all have the same problem too, is how I convince people in my age group that they need to be politically involved um, and the importance of voting. And everyone's tired of hearing me because every place I go are, you're gonna vote, you're gonna vote. How do you guys 
talk to your colleagues, to your friends, to maybe even people who are, are out of your age group? And what do you say to them? I mean, Selena, I mean, tell me. Uh, when I start off with the idea that I think a lot of people think that they have to do really big things. They have to give a lot of time. Um, and I think part of that is that you have people coming to you who are giving a lot of time to advocate for people voting, to participate in organizations. I'm sure everyone on this panel gives a lot of their time. You don't have to do that to be involved though. You don't have to go to that level. You can absolutely just go vote. And that's a really big thing to do. And I think people think that if they do the little bit, they do the voting, they have to do everything else. And you don't. You can just vote. That's a big thing. It's your voice. It's important. That's just as important as any of us showing up to our organizations, to be honest. Um, I think also talking about how easy it is now in days. There's these very old ideals about voting and how narrow it is to get into voting and all that jazz. Uh, and in some places in America, that is definitely still a problem. In New Mexico, it is quite a bit easier because we are able to do so online. We're able to absentee ballot voting. We have a lot more options here now than we did maybe a decade or two ago, but we still have those decade or two ago ideals of how hard it is to vote. So just talking about how it is easier than we think it is and how they don't have to fully go too in depth into politics just because they decided to vote. Thank you. Nolan is one who doesn't vote yet. Do you, you must talk to people about the importance of participating and how do you interrelate with people even in, in the school that you go to? Do, do they have interest? What do you say? Um, so for me, what I've noticed is I feel like within people within my age group, um, it's very easy to get politically involved through social media, um, not even just willingly, but I feel like a lot of the time um, being on social media, you see different political ads or you see different political um, updates or newsletters and you see them constantly, like regardless if you're actively searching for that or not, like if you get on Twitter, it'll say something that happened with President Biden or President Trump and like you're in you're involved that way that it informs you. Um, but I've also noticed that specifically with my experience at the Indian school, uh, we've had a lot of political discussions just because they want to make sure that we're, um, we're ready for that next stage when we are able to vote and that we can be able to make informed decisions for ourselves and vote for what we believe in. Um, we've had several discussions about, um, just very varying political topics. We've talked about MMIW. We've talked about several different things where we just wanted to, uh, they wanted to make sure we could form an informed opinion um, using news sources and using different um, updates and make sure that we knew what was going on so that we were able to make the best decision for ourselves. Um, and I've also noticed that Whenever we've had those discussions, a lot of people within my age group, I would say the majority, are very informed on things that are happening and have strong opinions. Um, and I feel like specifically with my peers, I've noticed that we're all kind of ready to vote. I feel like we're all in very um, politically involved, even if we're not able to actually cast our vote yet, mm -hmm. we still are informed and in making having political conversations, even if we're not. Let me push you a little bit, though, and ask. So do you think or do you uh, that perhaps it's your school and your teachers um, that really are making that impact because of your need, uh, Native American folks, to be really still be part of everything that's going on and how many injustices have occurred? Do you think it's because of the school or... Do you know kids in other schools and are they as informed as you guys are? Um, I feel like I know quite a few people from outside of my school that are informed as well. Um, and the reason I say that is just because it is very easy to spread awareness and to have people see that, like, even if it's just you sharing um MMIW statistics on your Instagram story or something, it's very easy for someone else to see that. and share that as well. 
um, to inform people. And I feel like that's one of the easiest ways of communication. And while that can, um, I just feel like using that is really important to help inform other people. And I just think that's one of the major ways that people are getting their information now is through social media. So I feel like you have to utilize that in order to promote um, the type of political change you want to see to get people involved, to get people aware so that they can also decide to vote and make change when it's their turn. Cool. A positive outlook with social media. That's good. Zoe. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that obviously I know a, a particular subset of people, so this is not true of all young people, but most people I know are informed about, you know, issues in the world and they care about things. Um, but I think what, what I see with people in their twenties often is this sense of despair and this sense that, you know, the, the government isn't doing anything for us or there's, there's no way to change whatever it is. There's a lot of like doomism, if you've heard that term. Um, <laughs> like, as, especially when it comes to things like climate change, like a lot of people really feel like there's no hope um, and like elected officials aren't doing anything. Um, and so people kind of fall into this like despair mindset where they're like, well, if the current elected officials aren't doing any good, then voting doesn't do any good. And then there's no point to any of it. And what I always say to these people is, well, you know, it may not change everything, but if, if none of us do anything, all that will happen is all of the issues will get worse. Right. Um, like, no, elected officials are not the be all end all of, of change they're they're not but they are something you ha and you're we're not just voting for people i think that's important for people to remember also is there's always like constitutional amendments and and all sorts of other things on the ballot when you vote and it's important to look into all of that as well so that you know what you're voting on um and to make informed decisions about the the elected officials you're voting for you know your senators your representatives your governor the president whoever it is um, all of that is important and it's important to, to be involved in other ways, but I think it's just really important to impress on people that just because you feel like voting doesn't, isn't going to change the world and like your vote isn't going to make a difference or whatever, it's still important to do it. It's still important to do this collective thing that is an important civil right that we have you know, so many groups in this country have had to fight for over the centuries of this country existing is the right to vote. Um, and just the amount of voter suppression in this country should tell you that voting does do something, right? Um, like I said, it's absolutely not the be all end all, but as, as Salina said, if you can't get involved in other ways, you should vote. Everyone should vote. That That is like the most basic thing. That is the most basic way to be involved. Even if you feel despair, do, do research. Research what you're voting on. Make decisions. Vote for the best candidate for you. Um, yeah. That's good because I've heard that before and I'm so happy that you brought that up because it's something to talk about, just despair about not thinking you can make a difference, Mark. Well, um, I mean, I've had plenty of conversations with my, you know, you know, friends and peers and all that and a lot of people in my circle and even outside my circle too. Um, you know, I, I try my best usually before I say anything to them or stress upon the need to vote, you know, to listen first, because 
I think a lot of the the energy and nuances and and feelings that I register when I'm having conversations with different peers that I know, a lot of people I think are coming from a place of pain and despair and even, you know, and it's easy to get jaded, you know, I, I can definitely comprehend that. I mean, I may not understand where everybody is coming from because everyone's experiences are vastly different or can be, but um, I can definitely comprehend, you know, the sentiments of negativity, you know, it's, it's justified, unfortunately, to a degree. Um, that being said, you know, when it comes to me and voting, um, I'm not voting for anything, every leaning you can think of, every whatever it is, is going to have its, you know, its impurities, its negative sides, you know, whatever have you. Um, for me, I'm voting for in the direction of what is comparatively the most impactful path and direction that we can begin really taking our communities in this entire country as a whole in the direction of. Um, I'm not voting for an overnight solution or the one all be all candidate that's going to wave an imaginary wand and make it all the problems go away. Um, and then I do that, I vote for that. Um, knowing that this is a continued fight and we're going to have a lot ahead of us, even when it's not an election, you know, there's a lot to do. We need to keep pressuring our elected officials and politicians who we voted for. We need to keep really actively doing this work. And um, yeah, because if we don't, you know, it's a big cliche, but if we don't do anything, <laughs> you know, that's pretty much worse than, you know, yeah, that's it's it's a hell of a lot worse, but um, we need to get in, you know, the short answer is we just need to get actively involved and, you know, keep up all this work, you know, as as hard as that can be to say and as much as that stresses us out because we're being inundated with so much information daily. Um, you know, we just have to stick together, you know, so. Thank you, Mark. Um, can I add an additional comment really quickly? Of course you can. Um, I would just thought about this for a second when um, Zoe was speaking. One of the most important things I also want to say is that um, being able to recognize as stressful as it can be and as bur like as much of a burden as it can feel like, getting politically involved, um, if you're able to, if you're able to vote, recognizing the privilege that you have by being able to do that and utilizing that is extremely important. Yes. Um, like Zoe said, the voter suppression that happens specifically a lot among native communities uh, throughout the United States, especially on reservations and the restrictions that are put upon people to make sure that they can't vote and they can't utilize that. Um, I think it's really important for the people that even though it may feel like stressful or like something you have to do, it's really important to be thankful that you have the ability to do that. There are other people that are um, constantly being restricted or being um, suppressed in order to make sure that it's harder for them to vote and um, that they can't. Whereas if you are in somewhere where you are 20 minutes away from a poll station and you feel very um, anxious about doing it, it's still really important to check, like, at least I'm able to do that. And maybe I should utilize my voice so that I can create change in the future. Exactly. So now, uh, one thing that I want to mention here that I have to, from our perspective as HRA, is that we're a, um, a not-for-profit 501c3. So we host and do things like this to make communities become involved. We, I, none of our board members are allowed to tell you who to vote for. That's not what we do. But what we do is tell you to go out and vote and please vote on things and issues, which is what I think we need to start telling people that affect you. And if you're in the LGBTQIA2S community, and you want to know who is going to have your back, 
go to the Equality New Mexico, EQNM.org website because they vetted all of the candidates and they've answered questionnaires and they can tell you who will support the community. Um, let's just talk a little positive right now, just for a second, because there's a lot of, you know, we are living in a state that has a lot of positive things going on for it right now under this current administration, um, that we have a voice. The LGBTQIA plus two community has a voice, um, voice has been being developed for 30 years, believe it or not, EQNM. Pride in Santa Fe and the Human Rights Alliance next year celebrate 30 years. And those are we're gonna, we were founded and as was EQNM to help with LGBTQIA plus two initiatives within the state. So let's positively think that we have something really great going on. Um, and then think like, how do we handle um talking to people, which you've started to talk about. And then Mark, I want to touch on something you said towards the end, sure. which was, and maybe I'm paraphrasing, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, but if you don't go out and vote, I have to say to you, this is my thing, that you're responsible for whatever happens because you didn't go out and vote. And you can't say, well, see, I, you know, see, this is what was going to happen. Maybe you can say that if you went out and voted, but if you didn't go out and vote, you're kind of saying it's okay that all of this, excuse me, shit will start to happen. And it's, it's kind of not right. Um, so we have an understanding of what the backside of this could be if for this very next election, which we're talking about is in what, five weeks, six weeks we're looking at, um, if things nationally change um, politically um, with the control of the House or the Senate uh, and things start to get put forward, then what do we do? How do we, you know, this is not on your questions, how would you, what would your scenario be if the Senate and the Congress both switched, and we're looking at uh, introduction of a national, nationwide abortion ban and discrimination, and then changing the law. And I'm not saying this is going to happen, but this has already been alluded to, that same-sex marriage will no longer be valid, and states can make a decision. What do you do? Um, I think the simplest answer to that is you fight. I... In May, right before we heard that this might be a thing that was going on, at least for the same-sex marriage, my spouse and I got married because we wanted to get a few months in of at least being married. Um, I remember when we didn't have that, and I remember when we got it. That was actually before I came out. And so I celebrated in private and it was amazing to get to have that and to get it to be legal. So you fight. As for a lot of those, that probably sounds really big and kind of privileged to say. <laughs> and it is, it is. Um, you don't have to fight big though. And you don't have to come up with a solution. There are, as far as abortion rights goes, there are abortion rights groups that have been doing this for decades, that have been doing this for years, that seven years ago said that this might be coming down the line. So they have a plan. You don't have to come up with the plan. You just have to follow it. You just have to look up those organizations and join them. That's all you have to do. And that's what, if that happens, which hopefully it doesn't, but that's what I'm going to do too. I don't have to come up with the plan. The plan is already there. There are people who did that. I just have to add my voice, add my support, add my story. Um, and that's exactly what my plan is to do, is to add my support to people who are a little bit more experienced than me in this and a little bit more knowledgeable than me in this and fight as hard as I can. Mark? Um, well, I'd like to uh, touch on something very specific. Um, 
we really need to do whatever we can, and I'm serious, to combat voter suppression efforts as much as possible. I mean, there, I mean, it's not just like, you know, big efforts that we hear, you know, being broadcasted via the media or whatever. It's there can be little subtle ways too that they do it. Um Really, I think, you know, however it may be expressed, however we may use our voice, you know, one of the most powerful things about especially being in a group of people who, you know, tends to be systemically marginalized is that one of the most powerful things is our voices. And um, we cannot let these people get away with forcing us to shut up. We have to use this power, this piece of power and um, add our voice to the entire collective story, like, you know, you said, and, um, yeah, just, um, echoing, uh, what she, what they said, um, you know, fight, you don't have to fight big, but I'm, but fight. Zoe. Yeah. Um, I think, I, I actually, I remember exactly where I was when, when same-sex marriage was legalized. I was in a car driving across California um, with my mom, who I was not out to at the time. It was very surreal and like a huge moment in my life. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the idea of that decision being reversed is like really a lot. And, and, you know, Roe v. Wade already has been reversed. Like, there's bad things have happened bad things can continue to happen um and like i said earlier i think the important thing is is to remember that voting is one thing that you should be doing um i think going to to protests and rallies for causes you care about if you are physically able to do so if it is safe for you to do so um and then also just generally organizing in your community, things like mutual aid. I mean, giving to the people who need it. Find If you are in need of assistance, finding the organizations, finding the people who can give you aid. And I do think that social media is really good for finding resources. Um, I think it's it's much easier than it used to be to find the organizations that are doing the work, to get involved with them, um, all of that. I also think it's important to remember that like spreading awareness and doing something are not the same. They're both important. Um, but posting an infographic on Instagram and like volunteering in your community are not equivalent actions um and and we need to share information and get involved and and form community because the only way that we will all survive this the only way that we will truly have the future that we all need and deserve is if we work together on it um and and that starts at home that starts with our friends and our coworkers and our families, you know, and, and social media is a tool and voting is a tool and, and organizing is a tool. Um, and, and we need to be doing all of those things, even in the face of the despair I was talking about earlier, um, is important, I think, not to, um, let that take you over um and to do the things that you are able to no one is able to do everything um and no one should be expected to do everything but we can do what we can no one i have a very similar opinion to what was already said um but i do think that when you look at what's happening overall and you see the don't say gay laws, you see the possibility of gay marriage not being legal anymore, you see the overturning of Roe versus Wade. I think it's very important to see what you can do. Um, some people are not privileged enough to 
um, have an accepting family or have a way to get to a protest because they're not out or they wouldn't want to be outed or feel safe somewhere. Um, and I do think it's very important for those who can vote, the same way you said, looking at resources that show which um, elected officials will help you in your community. Um, even casting one vote to help that person, I think could be very impactful, even if it doesn't feel that way. Um, I think it is important for those like myself who are um, underage, they're not able to vote yet. And they would love to have that vote that you are able to have, but um, you deciding not to use that is kind of, I think you have to take people that don't have that same privilege into consideration. Just for the people like myself who see all these different laws happening and all of these um, things being overturned and all this change being made, um, and you want to do something to help um, change, to help create change, but you can't because you're not eligible to vote yet, um, seeing other people not utilize that is kind of harmful. And so I feel like it could be very important for somebody to look into who can represent your community, vote for them, um, just do what you can, I think is very important because I think, like they said, not all change has to be big change. Um, I feel like even if all you are able to do is post on Instagram, this candidate is very outspoken about supporting the LGBTQ community. If that's all you're able to do, that's, I feel like that's better than doing nothing. I feel like putting whatever you can, your best foot forward and what able you're able to do to speak out for your communities or advocate, um, vote, whatever you are able to do, I think that's the best. If you're doing the best that you can do, I think that that is good enough. That's, that's right. Um, it's interesting with social media, I'm gonna make a comment because you guys touched on something. So, so many people I know in my age group all like, you know, if I put a post up that's political, they all like it, but I don't really know how motivated they are by it or if they were gonna stand in a room with me to have the conversation about something, are they really an ally or are they just saying they're an ally? Um, and this is a whole separate topic that we won't get into today, but I personally find it interesting, even on the simplest level. I hope I don't offend anyone here, but it's the truth. When someone says, oh, yeah, um, you know, I went to Chick-fil-A to have lunch and I'm like, you know, get out of here. I don't even want to talk to you. Well, why? Well, because they don't support our community. As a matter of fact, they actually do everything they can to try to put us down. So. That, those are all forms of a collective allyship that is being involved, I guess, right? I mean, it could be something simple. Um, you guys being obviously younger than me, do you have you seen this among any of your peers? Are they involved in understanding like the, the major corporations that really are against the LGBTQIA plus two community? Or, or are they aware? You start. Um, they are aware. I think some of that overwhelmingness that's been talked about is there too, because there are a lot of organizations that don't support people like us. Um, and so I think a lot of people struggle with where the cutoff is. My idea for that is if the cutoff is like people who are donating huge amounts of funds to end our existence with legislation. Um, and Chick-fil-A is one of those. <laughs> they are heavily one of those. Hobby um, Lobby. Yes, they, they, that is a huge priority for them. Actually, we took up a lot of their brain power actually. Um, so I think that's where kind of the cutoff should be for me personally, but I do see a lot of people I know struggle with that. Uh, we had a roommate who was queer and would regularly bring Chick-fil-A into the home. <laughs> and we were like, we escaped it only to have it come back into our lives. Nice. Um, so that is a common thing I think that people struggle with is where is your personal cutoff for that? I do think that is something that everyone should explore where you're giving your money to. It's not just on you. Chick-fil-A is going to spend that money either way, but do you want them spending your money on that specifically is more so the question as far as that goes, do you want to give them your support? Do you feel emotionally good about that when you think about it? Or are you sneaking it in through the back door? 
Mark, anything to add? Yeah, um, you know, for I guess um, in my experience and in my circle, um, at least it's kind of a mixed bag. I think there are a lot of people who I know and um, who even maybe just met who were strike me as being pretty aware of things and aware of of those issues. Um, and then you have people who really just don't know a whole lot, if anything. Um, and then you have people who know all about it, but are, have become just so exhausted, um, which I can understand. Um, I think it's, you know, for me, it's a matter of, you know, when it comes to people knowing these things, but just becoming so exhausted and tired, it's how do you how do you reach people to help revitalize their energy and become mobilized again um, is a pretty um, big question there. But anyway, that's all I have to add for that. Zoe? Yeah, um, I, I've, I, for, for a long time now, I've been having conversations with friends about ethical consumption and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I feel like that it was half the conversations I had in college. Um, and there's definitely a truth about like the liberal arts college bubble. Cause I went to a liberal arts college in Iowa. Um, and, and, and leaving that, you know, here, things that I sort of took for granted as, I guess, standards of allyship in college are no longer the case. I mean, basically no one I know in Santa Fe uses anyone's correct pronouns ever. Um, <laughs> there's no conversation around those things in, in a lot of circles. Um, and things that I used to think were, were basic now are things that I have to have different sorts of conversations around, but, um, and, and ultimately I think it's a case of picking your battles when that happens. Like I'm not, I'm not going to try to be everyone's moral compass all the time and tell people, Oh, well, I think this. And so you have to behave in this way, but I think it is important to, to have these conversations about, you know, corporate spending and and um lobbying you know it's um organizations corporations like like chick-fil-a and hobby lobby that give so much money to anti-queer efforts um and then there's you know other things that we can't necessarily do anything about as individual consumers like oil you know most of us drive and need to buy gas and you can't really just opt out of that in in most of this country unfortunately that isn't a moral choice that we can make um but choosing where you get your sandwich is a moral choice that you can make right um and there's a lot of conversations with this in like media circles as well i'm also a, a media critic and i think a lot about that and my cutoff is always am if I did this thing would I be financially supporting someone who is causing active harm um and if the answer is yes I do not do it um and I try to have those conversations with people in my life but as I said we don't always get that choice when it comes to things like putting gas in your car. Um, but we do get that choice when it comes to where, you know, if there are multiple choices, you can pick the less harmful options. Um, and you can educate the people in your life about the fact that certain options are harmful and are bad. Thank you, Nolan. So I, um, I agree with everything that's been said. And I also want to say that I feel that it can, um, like somebody touched on the overwhelmingness, just because I know specifically within my age group, um, there, because of the rise in spreading social media, political information, it can feel very, um, because you're not old enough to vote yet. I know some people feel like they can't make change. And I feel like 
when you specifically look at um, supporting Chick-fil-A or supporting Hobby Lobby or doing things like that, um, you can because there's a choice there of if you are informed that these companies are donating to anti-LGBTQ organizations or um, organizations that don't support certain people, um, I feel like, like Zoe said, um, talking about if you have multiple choices, which one will you choose? If you choose to support Chick-fil-A and you feel like, oh, well, the money is spent there anyway, do you feel ethically okay knowing you contributed to that? Like, do you feel okay knowing that maybe your $2 that you spent on a Diet Coke or something is being donated to an organization to help um, oppress LGBTQ people? Um, and I feel like that's one of the major ways you can get involved is that even if you aren't old enough to vote or um, you have certain other issues involving yourself politically, I feel like basic decisions like that, where you know a company isn't supportive of a certain group of people, are you going to choose to stop supporting them and to help make change by saying, well, that's two less dollars that they have, that company has to help support that. And I think that is a really important conversation to have is just checking the ways that you may be supporting companies that you are not even sure, um, can like not even sure donate to anti-LGBTQ, not even just specifically LGBTQ, but just um, organizations that don't represent what you agree with. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like educating yourself on that and specifically looking at Hobby Lobby or Chick-fil-A, just once you know that, even if somebody on the Zoom call like didn't know that um, they don't support LGBTQ people, once you are informed to have that kind of discussion with yourself and say, am I going to stop supporting them to make sure that I don't feel like I contributed to that at all? Okay. Any questions? Do we have anything online? Of course. Okay. Okay. Nothing for right now. Okay. Um, so thank you, everyone, because I learned a lot. Um, I hope that we, um, the Human Rights Alliance, can facilitate doing these type of discussions on a regular basis because um, it seems to me that we need to organize the community uh, a lot better here. I'm not saying anyone's to blame for it, but I say in general, I think there's a lot of ways to organize the community to bring um, the young, the middle-aged and the older people together. Because we all have a lot of very interesting stories to tell. Um, I try to um, educate people about pronouns. For example, you gave that example. Um, and it's really hard uh, for people in my age group to get a grasp of it, um, which is interesting. And I just say, you know, you're going to make a mistake. So you make a mistake and you say, oh, OK, I'll call you them from now on. Right. Um, that those type of things are things that I can do, which are a little bit different, because a lot of people in my age group look at me like and the word that people have a hard time understanding that are older is queer. Because in, when I was your age, that was not a term that you would call anyone. It was quite derogatory, which I know you guys probably know that history. So the older folks are like, I just don't get that. I'm like, but you don't have to get it. You know, just like it's, uh, we're going to reset. You know, when the record goes, dee, 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 we're just going to reset and say that, you know, there are a lot of things that are changing. And sometimes you have to pull people along for the ride. And I appreciate the fact that you all seem to be doing that um, because that the kind of stuff, just even you all agreeing to be here is very, very important for what our organization now really needs to get back to doing, which we've been working on and for the greater community uh, on so many levels. And just as an aside, so um, everyone understands that it's kind of a nationwide effort right now that all of the LGBTQIA plus two community 
centers and organizations are all on the fight on the same side of someone's right to choose their own health care, whoever that is. So we are all in that fight together across the country. And I, my positive side of all of this is if you think about everyone, all of the women, all of the men, and all of them, and we're all in this together, we have a pretty strong, huge voting block of people that really can get messages across. And they, we, they, we, none of us should be afraid to get out and talk. Anyone have anything you would like to add or say? I do actually, um, kind of on the positive side of it, uh, with the under 21 youth program I work with, we see a lot of youth who are under 21. Shocking considering the name, uh, <laughs> within that we get to see just how awesome they are and how positive it is. We have a ton of youth who know who they are, who are comfortable exploring their identity, which at that age, I wasn't even comfortable calling myself any form of LGBT. So it's amazing to see some of them are in the closet once they leave that group, but they come in and they are just so unapologetically themselves. It is such a positive to see. They're so well-informed um, for quite a few of them. They come in, they have this huge, wonderful discussions about politics and life and just everything in general. Uh, and so I think it's amazing to see in a world where we see so many negatives or especially in the political sphere where we see so many bad things happening. It's truly wonderful to see that the people come in behind us, the people that are barely coming into voting, that are coming into being allowed to use that wonderful voice that they have, oftentimes have such a great head on their shoulders and are just genuinely such wonderful human beings to be around who just have these very loud voices that advocate for themselves, for others. It's wonderful to see. I that, that's thrilling for me to hear. It's 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 and I've seen some of it, and um, that's that's the positive. I agree with you. We have to take all those positives. You guys have anything to say? Um, I guess I'll go. Go. <laughs> um, you know, I think it goes without saying. Nobody can really one hundred percent, you know, accurately predict what the future is going to be, whether it be like you know, a future of doom or, you know, everything's hunky dory in the universe and there's no problems. Um, I mean, we're in the present. Um, I think right now there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of value in asking how far have we come um, because there are a lot of, you know, great things we've done a lot. There has been good progress and, uh, you know, sometimes we don't talk about that as much because we understandably, you know, get sidetracked with all the negative that we do need to be paying attention to because it's a serious thing you know it's all serious but there is um you know a lot of value in asking and reminding ourselves hey you know look at all this we've done and look at what we can continue doing in the present or in the present excuse me and um you know what do we want to see our future as being? And I'll loosely uh, quote a play called The Normal Heart for a moment. We are not invisible people. We're not. We have to really claim our moment in history and our stories. And I really believe that we can do that regardless of being uncertain of the future, so. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, well, yes, well, yes, well, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Zoe or Nolan, do you want to say anything? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I I agree with Mark completely. Um, I I love looking at at queer history, and yes, I always use the word queer unless individuals are uncomfortable with it because I like how deliberately inclusive and unclunky it is. Um, I think that it's really important to look at at queer history and at you know the 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 queer four parents who have come before us and who have fought for our rights and all of the rights that we do have and all of the progress that we have made and 
understanding ourselves as as part of a larger movement and a larger tradition that you know transcends this one moment while also appreciating the moment that we are in and and having hope and optimism for the future without just blindly hoping you know actively working toward the future that we want in whatever ways we are able to um and just not getting lost in that despair and not losing all hope and optimism um and understanding that everything can't be great everything can't change for the good right away but that you know we can do our part we can work together we can have happiness in our communities um despite everything and you know work work for the future to be happier thank you Nolan. i agree i think that if you walk away with like one message from this entire panel discussion it would just be to use your voice um like everybody said looking back at um your communities throughout history and what they've done to fight for you even just to be here um and survive in 2022, um, specifically myself as an LGBTQ plus um, native person, looking at back at my answers, my ancestors and what they did to fight just for my community and myself to be still here and active as human beings in 2022. And I think that it, if you take anything away, it would just be to use your voice so that we can continue to create change for future generations. Thank you. You ready? Okay. So I will just close. I want to thank all of you. I'm going to thank you more in a minute. But first, I want to say that our program here of New Mexico Listens has been done under the auspices of the National Endowment for the Humanities, a program they've done called A Better Union. Um, that money came down to us through the New Mexico Humanities Council who then passed it on to the League of Women Voters. And so I wanna thank all three of those organizations for everything they've done for us. This is our last program under this auspices. We're not stopping though, because we think we need to learn to listen and we need to learn to hear, I'm gonna cry, other people's voices, different voices, people who don't always have a chance, people who feel like they might be invisible to talk, right? And for other people who are not invisible to hear it right? So important. Um, so as part of the League of Women Voters, I just wanted to say some few things about voting, which has already started here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. New Mexico makes it quite easy to vote. Early voting starting at your county clerk offices on the 11th. On the 22nd, I believe, it opens up to more locations. Mm -hmm. um, you can find those locations by going to the Secretary of State's website nmvote.org or you can also go to your county clerk's site and they will tell you um, there's another resource online from the league of women voters it's called vote411.org they have um, spoken to all the candidates asked them a specific set of questions and all of that information is listed online there for you um, it's also very easy to vote absentee it's no excuse absentee voting in new mexico you can go online again to the Secretary of State's website to get an application. You send that application in, you can take it to your county clerk or you can mail it in and um, they will send a ballot back to you to vote with. And election day, of course, is November the 8th, Tuesday, November the 8th. So now I wanna to say to all of you, everything you have said resonates so deeply with me. Whew. Um, I'm going to try not to cry again. I wanted to jump up and answer your first question with you. And I also wanted to answer the question, what happens when they start taking our rights away? Yes, we're going to fight back. <laughs> yes, we're going to stand together, all of us, and we're going to make, make it work. But in the meantime, we have an election to get through and we have to get as many people out to vote as we can. Um, so let's start by voting ourselves. And when you take yourself to the ballot box, please take your neighbors, your family, your friends, as exactly. many people as you can take with you so that we can have hopefully a successful election. And Kevin, thank you so much to you and your organization for, this is I think our third or fourth program together. 
Third. Well, if we count you being a, a panelist oh, yourself, a panelist yes. On, yeah, so thank you. I think I we, we've that. developed a great relationship. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. And also thank you to my good partner, Irene. So thank you to Irene yes. and to Rick Ann yes. for um, allowing um, me to have an opportunity to do this and get some really good information out to people. Absolutely. Will you remind them about that this will be archived and how yes. they could access it? Yes. So I will thank also our loyal Yay. tech over here, Goyo Yay. Perez. Yay. And, and today his assistant, Tess, Tessa. Tessa, Yay. thank you so much. So yes, you see that they are recording and this will be archived on the New Mexico Humanities Council's website if you want to go back and see it. Um, Goyo is also working on a film to summarize all of the different panels we've had in the last year, not only here in Santa Fe County, but around the state. So it should be, should be a really great, it's going to be a short cool. little 10 minute with interviews, et cetera. So it should be great. Cool. So I think that's it. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, very. Uh, yes, I feel buoyed. Thank you. We're done. <laughs> <laughs>